Don Mitchell, Eileen Creamer, here. Barack Aba Brock Backel, Kevin O'Donnell, here. Lynn McGarry, here. Joe Maska, here. Um, Mayor Yukic, Trustee Jurin, Barry, Barry, Caprio, Caprio, Caprio. Costa, um, Trokey, Nitsky Trokey, Trustee Rogers, Trustee Sweeney, present. <laughs> uh, for the record, we also have a number of uh, village staff here this evening. Uh, so maybe they could stand up and introduce themselves. Uh, Mike. Candace, make sure that uh, she has each of your views. I'm interim village manager Heather Kokodinsky. I am Gina Spito. Um, I do reception and accounts payable. I'm admin analyst Sean Keen. Administrative assistant Sue Steinman. Deputy clerk Kathy Carrick. Jamie Patch, economic development director. Mike Schwartz, director of finance. Uh, as far as uh, next item here, uh, thank you very much for being here, everyone. Uh, uh, next section on the agenda is uh, public comment. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on items not listed on the agenda that are related to matters which concern the plan commission? So open public comment. Uh, if not, uh, we'll move on to uh, the workshop portion of the agenda. Uh, the primary item on our agenda this evening is a planned commissioner training workshop presented by the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, CMAP, in partnership with the American Planning Association, Illinois Chapter, and the Chaddock Institute for Metropolitan Development at DePaul University, via a grant awarded to the Village of Homer Glen under the CMAP Local Technical Assistance Program. Mike, uh, could you please introduce our guest speakers? Sure. I'd like to introduce Michael Blue uh, and Lori Marston, and they can uh, give them give you uh, uh, a little overview of their background. Introduce themselves. Thank you. Well, we'll start with the microphone, but <clears throat> usually I end up walking around, and uh, nobody's ever told me they can't hear me. So if you can't, just say so. But thank you very much for for having us. Um, Again, uh, my name is Michael Blue. I'm uh, currently a consultant. I'm a principal consultant with Tesco Associates. Um, I've been doing this now officially since the Bears won the Super Bowl. So there's nothing like them telling you that it's been 30 years for something that happened for you to realize you've been doing something else for 30 years. Um, but I've spent about half my career working for consulting firms uh, and about half of it working for municipalities. Um, I was the uh, community development director in Highland Park up on the city on the North Shore in Lake County. Uh, for 10 years and worked for the Village of Mount Prospect. So I uh, have kind of seen both both sides of the table. Um, did spend a little bit of time as a plan commissioner in Evanston. That's where Lori and I first met. Lori was a commissioner. I was just an associate commissioner. I only voted if there was nobody else there. But, um, but I had fun anyway. Um, and uh, so I'm here tonight with my, my hat on from the American Planning Association, the Illinois <coughs> chapter. Uh, I'm the planning official development officer. Um, we have a committee that includes Lori and I and several other folks, uh, and we put together this program um, and have done, what you say now, 55 of these training sessions, and um, are very excited to be able to do this because um, as commissioners and as staff, thank you all for coming, staff, um, you really, we know as, as planners that we can't do what we do without the commissioners, the elected officials, the other staff members that we work with. 
So it's a treat for us to be able to come and share some background about the planning and development side of it. Um, we're doing this um, in concert with CMAP, as you said, Mr. Chairman Patrick's here from, from CMAP, uh, holding up their end, of the, uh, their end of the flag tonight. We, we thank him very much for that. We've been doing these workshops with CMAP, CMAP for about almost three years now. This is the third year we've done them. Um, four? Maybe. Three or four. <laughs> still getting over the 30-year thing so um, so the um, uh, so we've had a chance to do this all over the, the metropolitan area which has been a lot of fun we've also done some of these uh, downstate Illinois and, and out west so um, part of the reason that it's great is you as commissioners and, and as staff too you spend a lot of time dealing with the the gory details of whatever site plan or whatever matter or whatever case you're dealing with and you know, is the fence on the property line or adjacent, and is the garage six feet setback or eight? You know, it's it's very much about the details of implementing and making things happen. Um, and what we're looking forward to doing tonight is to get everybody to kind of a step back and take a look at the big picture of how we all work, how we all do this, why we all do this. Um, and so the um, the important thing is that you don't just sit there quietly and listen the whole time. This works way better if it's a discussion. Um, and if you've got ideas or questions or things that happened maybe at the last planning commission meeting that you want to test out, um, let's let's talk about those. Um, we understand from Mike we're going to be here at about 10, 10.30, quarter to 11, did you say? <laughs> um, we'll see. We'll see. I see people running out the door about 8.15. Um, but no, if it's all right, we planned on 9 o'clock. Is that, is that good with everybody? And we're, we're good at, uh, at sticking to the time and coming close anyway. Um, but uh, again, that's kind of the idea. As I said, the American Planning Association is a national organization uh, of about 40,000 members. The Illinois chapter's got about 1,500, um, mostly practicing planners, uh, also folks in affiliated professions and planning commission members. So if you're interested, um, we'll have, there's actually in the back of the presentation up here, we'll have some websites uh, that list where you can go to find out information about it. It's just a way to stay informed and active. Lori, did you want to kind of introduce yourself and say a couple words about Chaddock before we get kicking? Um, I'm, I wear a couple of hats. I'm the technical advisor at the Chaddock Institute, which is at DePaul University. And we do, in addition to these training workshops, we also do training workshops for professional planning staff. We have a, a municipal design review network, which is obviously about design review. And we also do, every year we give um, development awards to municipalities um, around the area for various things. So that's what we do. My background is, in addition to being on the plan commission in Evanston, as a citizen planner like yourself, um, I served for a number of years in, in the public sector. Um, I was spent nine years as director of community development for the village of Walmart. And for the last number of years, I've been a planning consultant and work around the Chicago area. Um, so a couple things tonight, we want to keep it very informal. Also, maybe you should have three different handouts. One is the PowerPoint, which is blue. The other is kind of background information, which has the green cover. And the other is a one-page evaluation form, which you'll fill out totally anonymously at the end. Is there anybody that doesn't have all three forms? I have three. Okay. Um, and also, has everybody signed in? Because we want everyone to sign in. Is this the green that you're talking Yes, about? that's the green one. Does everybody have this? No. I don't. Okay, she's got it. Laura, we have, um, for the certificates, I have the plan commission members signing in. Okay. Uh, on, you know, so they'll get their training certificates. But for just the general audience, um, I, we didn't make them sign in unless they wanted to speak. Like okay, uh, certainly, um, I mean, we can, um, um, certainly any of the trustees that are here, if they want to sign in and get the certificate, that's fine. Okay. It's okay if the staff wants to too, that's totally up to however you feel. Um, does anybody need any of the, the blue handout, the PowerPoint handout? Does everybody have this one? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Everybody's got this one there. Mm -hmm. You all have. Okay. Thank you. Can the staff get a certificate? As oh, well? sure. No, so anybody who's here. Yeah. Oh, anyone okay. who wants to sign okay. in can can get one. Yeah.
did you say you're, you're the remote, or is it sir? I'll be the, I'll be your remote, yeah, I'm going okay. to the computer. Did you want us to go back there, or? You can, no? if you want to, you can, or if you want to just, I'll leave it up to you. If you do you mind if I just point and you'll yep. click them? Thank That's you. That's what I'll do. So Michael, go ahead. go ahead and hit it. All right. Thank you. Uh, so these are the these are the um, the organizations that we mentioned um, that are participating agencies. Go ahead. So um, just by way of what we're going to cover tonight, um, the welcome and introductions. We're kind of moving through here. We want to talk about sort of planning 101. What is it that you need to know? Generally, basic history of planning. Um, as we like to say, this is kind of the planning short course. So everything that Lori and I went to college to for four years, or in my case five, um, you know, we'll teach you in about 15 minutes. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the specific tools of the trade, some of the documents, some of the reports, some of the things that you use that are tools for you. And we'll talk about how this all kind of fits together. Um, and then we're going to talk about who else is involved in the process. And this is not just something that you all do on your own, or frankly, at Homer Glenn does on its own. There's a lot of other folks involved. Uh, and so we're going to talk about the roles that they have uh, and share some perspectives on what everybody else is doing. Uh, and then just because you'll be a good audience, we're going to share some tricks of the trade. Uh, some things about uh, running meetings, Robert's rules, those kinds of things, uh, the ins and outs of all, all that sort of stuff. And like I said, we'll, uh, we'll be attentive to everybody's time. We'll try and be out of here by 9 o'clock. So that cool with everybody? All right. Remember, I said it's all better if, if it's a discussion, not a tirade. I mean, a, uh, a lecture. Um, also, too, we're just going to keep rolling. We don't have any breaks built in. So, if you need cookies, sorry, you guys, are waiting on the side of the room. But help yourself. Restroom, coffee. Don't don't feel you got to sit here for the whole time. If you got to get up, then uh, that's perfectly all right. So, this is Daniel Burnham. No self-respecting presentation about planning can start without a picture of Daniel Burnham, who is generally considered to be the father, or at this point maybe the grandfather, uh, of urban planning. Um, he's famous for this quote that you might have heard, make no little plans. Uh, the modern version of this is sort of think big or go, you know, go big or go home. Um, but he's um, best known for having done the plan for the city of Chicago uh, in the early 1900s. He's also known for having planned the, the White City, the 1893 Columbian Exposition. Anybody ever read the book, The Devil in the White City, or heard of it? He's in that, he's not the murderer, he's the other guy. Um, but uh, again, he, th this, is, this is when planning got, got started, right? Um, so we're talking about uh, the late 1800s, the World's Fair, the, the White City, right? The idea that the, um, the, the turn of that century uh, cities were not pristine, well-kept places. The other good book is The Jungle. If you haven't read The Jungle, that's another fun one. Um, you know, people lived and worked at the same, in the same kind of neighborhood, but the places they worked were like slaughterhouses, right? So it wasn't necessarily all about quality of life. Um, you know, the, the conference of plan that you have here in Homer Glen talks a lot about the open spaces and appreciating the amenities that you have and, and the, uh, the, the, um, the, the open areas was not so much what people were welcome to uh, at this time. So the idea of planning started about creating a better place for people to live, pure and simple. Um, and it led, to, uh, it led to zoning, which is the idea of separating things. So yeah, OK, you had to have a slaughterhouse, you're going to have places to live, but let's separate them. right? And so that's how all these notions started to get cooking. Um, 1926. Um, Ambler Realty versus Euclid, Ohio. This was the case, the court case of the Supreme Court that said zoning is constitutional. So this was this is Planning 101. We learn all about Ambler v. Euclid, where the um, the city of Euclid, Ohio, created zoning. They got sued over it, and they won, all the way to the Supreme Court. So this is where it comes from. And again, this is kind of the idea of the um, you know kind of the tenement housing in New York. Years ago, you could, if you wanted to shake hands with your neighbor, you just reached out of your bedroom window and he did the same, you shook hands. So th this is where all this comes from. It's all about quality of life. It started being about light and air, just separation between buildings. Uh, and it's grown into what we deal with every day. So the, the, um, the focus of comprehensive planning uh, is to create an idea of what does every town want to be. 
and Homer Glen is a relatively new town. So, uh, and your comprehensive plan was 04, 05, 05? Um, and the idea is to decide what is going to be the community's vision, which I read. Um, and it's great. And it spells out all those things that you want to be. This becomes kind of the, the bellwether against, which you, against what you consider the decisions that you make. And it, it comes down to a lot more technical stuff, but there's still that idea. Um, and that, that comes from the comprehensive plan. And like I said, the village um, has got one. Uh, from 2005, it, it designates land use. Um, it talks about how things should be implemented. Mike, can you take the next one? Um, the most important thing that it, it should direct is what you do in terms of your zoning and your subdivision codes. Um, but it also send out general practice, uh, and it should be a tool for you as commissioners when a case comes before you, one of the questions you should ask is, is this in keeping with our comprehensive plan? Which is saying, is this in keeping with our vision? Is this in keeping with who and what we want to be? And the zoning ordinance gets into very technical aspects of that. But keep in mind, this is always where it's going. It's always going back to the vision, and you're always asking the question, is what we're looking at, is what we're being asked to consider, the policy questions we're looking at, are they, are they helping to fulfill uh, our, our comprehensive plan? Um, you know, we didn't ask, but as commissioners, how long have you all been on the commission? Were, were any of you on the commission when the plan was done? Yes. I, yeah, I, I was. Okay. So some yes, some no. So some of you inherited it, and some of you helped write it. Mm -hmm. Deal. Um, but that's part of the reason for having it, so that it lasts beyond a particular commission or any particular commissioner, right? The idea is that the comprehensive plan is well established and well understood and carries beyond any particular group of people. Let's keep going. What gets included in a comprehensive plan? So these are kind of the, the typical things that get included. What is the land use? What's going to be where? Um, the environment, community facilities and transportation elements. Mike, you can go ahead and hit the next one too. Um, utilities, housing, economic development. So these are all kind of the planning 101 topics uh, that, that can and should be in your plan. The reason these are up here is um, these were identified by the state of Illinois in an act called the Planning Technical Assistance Act, where um, the state passed this legislation and said, if you, municipalities, do a comprehensive plan and you include all of these elements in it so that you are, in fact, comprehensive, um, that the state could make available grants uh, to help pay for that planning. Um, so does everybody know the little secret, the little joke behind all this, is that after the state passed the law, they never funded the act. So they had the law that said that they could provide funding, but they never provided the funding. <coughs> You know, that was a lot funnier a couple of years ago, but I guess it is what it is. But the point is, um, comprehensive planning covers a lot. And it covers something different in every community. One of the things that you'll pick up as a theme tonight as, as we discuss through this, uh, and one of the things that, that we hope to leave you with is, um, for better or worse, there's no right answer in any of this. Um, you know, there is no correct mix of land uses. There was no 60% residential and 30% commercial and 10% something. There's just no right answer because every town is different. This, this vision statement that comes out of your comprehensive plan, this doesn't work in Orland Park. I mean, this is not for Orland. This is about Homer Glen. So, and, and towns always want to know, well, what are they doing next door? What did Plainfield do with this? Um, and that's fine. It's fine to understand what others do. Um, but every community is different, and that's one of the things we'd like you to, to understand and keep in mind as we keep going. Um, so for those of you that were here when you did the comprehensive plan, this may look familiar. Um, for others, the reason we want to touch on this is um, what is the process that you go to when you do a comprehensive plan? And this relates to a lot of the other kind of policy studies that you would do if you're looking to update the zoning ordinance, if you're looking to do a sub-area study uh, of a particular part of the town that's either incorporated or maybe might be incorporated, what's the process that you go through? What's, where, where should your head be at in terms of doing it? And so here's, here's where you start, right? You collect the data. You gotta understand where you are, gotta understand what you're doing. That's pretty simple. Strengths and opportunities, yep, yep, that makes sense too. You confirm the community vision, right? I love the I really love the vision statements um, because they are a true consolidation of what tens of thousands of people think of the town. 
Um, these are really hard to do. This one's really cool. This one goes into a lot of depth and a lot of, there's a lot of insight about what Homer Glenn wants to be and how it sees its future in, in this vision statement. If you haven't read it or haven't read it lately, um, pull it out and, and take a look at it. Um, you know, I, as we've already established, I've been doing this a long time. And what I can tell you from all the talents that I've worked in is when you start doing a comprehensive plan and you start doing the vision statement, one of the things you do here as part of this data collection is you talk to as many people as you can in the community. Understand the history, understand the present, understand where we want to go. And universally I would tell you that people look at you and go, you know, the village was fine when I moved in and those jokers at Village Hall have been screwing it up ever since. That's kind of the universal understanding of comprehensive planning and municipalities. But ask yourself why, and this is the, the second thing I'd like you to, to take away from my part of the presentation, is as soon as you do the plan, as soon as you get something established, what's the first thing that happens? Somebody comes to you with a development and what happens? Well, it changes. The rules. Right? The, right, the rules get better. Somebody wants to do something different, but it changes. Right? People moved here for a reason, whether they were here before we all incorporated or after. People <clears throat> moved here for a reason. And then what happens? You change it. You four up there. You did it, right? Um, very, <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at you. Um, it, change is hard for people. You know, it's hard for all of us. It's not good, bad, it's just what it is. That's what, that's what you're all doing, staff as well, um, is you're managing all of that change. So again, keep that in mind as, as we go through and we keep looking through this. Number five down here, prepare and evaluate plan options, right? Like I said, there's no right answer. There's a best answer, but there's not necessarily a right answer. Like, so then you select a preferred plan. You go with, the, with the, what's going to be best, even though you know it's going to change. Um, but then you keep in touch, right? You monitor the plan. Um, you know, it says here, ideally, you, you update or you look at your plan uh, every five years. Uh, I don't know that that's necessary. This, I, I look at this slide differently every time we put it up. What, what I like to suggest to communities is the good time to look at your plan is once a year. Not to redo it, but to look at it. Um, and a lot of towns will do it at budget time. When the village is sitting down and making decisions about how to spend its precious resources, the budget is a very important policy document. It's about setting priorities. Well, it's a good time to pull out the comprehensive plan and the vision statement and say, what were we thinking of doing? What, 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 was, what was real important to us? How do we get to where we want to be? Um, so that's, that's actually a better use of the plan. And then when it's no longer serving your needs, when you're all reviewing development proposals or staff is reviewing development proposals and the plan is just no longer helping you decide if those are a good idea, that's a good time to look at redoing the plan. But incorporate it into what you do. Um, in short, the idea of public participation um, is, is that it's, it's everybody's plan. It's, it's very important to ask the community. And there are, there are dozens of techniques for how to involve the community. Um, the, the challenge of public participation for a comprehensive planning process is that where this room may fill up as part of a development proposal that people are unhappy or unsure about, it's really hard to get this room to fill up when you're updating a comprehensive plan or studying the future. Um, <clears throat> because people are busy. People don't have time. Um, we have, when we do comprehensive plans, we have got, I've got a seven page memo that talks about all the stuff we do. Um, the internet is a very good tool these days. Email, outreach, um, working with local community groups, going into the schools. I mean, you, you almost have to chase people down and tackle them in the street to get them to an express an opinion uh, about the future of the community. Um, but it's important to do for a couple of reasons. One, you make sure that the planning that you do, again, not just comprehensive planning, but you make sure that the planning that you do reflects the interests, needs, and desires of the entire community. And, and I think this is just as important. You're letting the entire community know that the village of Homer Glen isn't just sitting around, that it's playing a proactive role in building the future that you're all looking for. So the plan is done. You've got this statement. Uh, you've got this. Um, uh, you've got this document that talks about implementation. So how do you get to the vision? How do you make all this stuff happen? Um, 
and this is the, the short, easy list. Um, you change your regulations. You know, I always like doing comprehensive plans because uh, we can all look at each other and go, well, this isn't carved in stone. Um, but then you get to the zoning ordinance, and that's where you're sort of carving it in stone a little more. Um, you talk about the, the policies that uh, the village is going to take in regard to all sorts of implementation pieces that all the staff end up dealing with on a regular basis. Um, capital improvements <coughs> are very, very important to relate to the comprehensive plan because the comprehensive plan should be identifying the areas where growth is going to be focused. So that's a good, uh, good thing to keep in mind when you decide where to spend money for capital improvements. Um, and then we talked about monitoring it, so like that. So that's sort of the, okay, here's what we're up to part of it. Any questions or thoughts uh, on that part of it before we, we move on? That's the introduction, that's the easy part. All right, let's keep going. So when you regulate development, when you do what you do at, at your meetings, um, municipalities have no specific authority to um, zone or to regulate development. It comes to them from the state of Illinois. It is granted as a function of the state's police power and it is passed down to municipalities through the state statutes. Um, it is important that regulation of development be, quite simply put, firm, fair, and consistent. Right? It needs to be consistent and we'll, we'll spend a lot of time, Lori will go into a lot of detail on that. Um, and it needs to be consistent um, independent of who's coming before you. And again, Lori will talk a lot about that. Um, it needs to be predictable, right? Um, in, in fact, one of the things, we work with a lot of developers as well. And from an economic development side, what the development world will tell you is that they're very much looking for a predictable process when they come to a community. They don't want to be assured they're going to get what they want. They don't want to be assured they're going to, they're going to um, be able to build exactly the plan they have. But they want it to be predictable. They want to know that um, if we're going to come to the plan commission, they get to the village board, that there's not all of a sudden any surprises, right? An extra meeting or an extra commission or an extra approval. Oh, you know what? We forgot to do the variation for this. Um, it's very important that there be a well-established, well-run process. And you've got the staff to do that. Not every town that we do this session with does. Um, so you've got a leg up uh, on doing that well already. But it's very important. Um, especially in this day and age when development is not happening. While it's happening fast, uh, it's not as easy to come by uh, as it was previously. Primary tools. Um, they're regulatory and they're, and they're advisory. Um, we talked about zoning. Um, the annexation process uh, is a very powerful way to control development. Subdivisions and building codes, sign codes, and we'll go into a couple of these in great detail, but some of these things are also advisory. So the plans don't have regulations in them. The plans for the community don't. Um, but they do inform the decisions that get made. They inform the, the flexible parts of those regulatory aspects. So the bottom line, I come back to this again. Um, for all these regulations, uh, there is no right answer. There is no uh, one bottom line in terms of whether or not something is, is the right way to do it. That's why you have staff. That's why you have a code that you get interpreted. Uh, and that's really your job. You know, we, we did one of these very early on. And um, one, of the, one of the plan commissioners asked us what I still think is one of the best questions we got, which was, well, you know, if you've got all this expertise and we've got staff that have all this expertise, what do you need the commissioners for? Um, and he asked it in a very genuine way. And we said, because the expertise that you as a commission bring is not just about the landscape plans and that sort of thing, but it's about the community, right? It's that merger of the vision and the codes, and that's really where the plan commission comes in. So there's no right answer. There's a lot of interpreting that goes on. That's part of the challenge. That's part of the charge. That's part of the responsibility. Let's keep going. So the zoning ordinance. Um, I always like to tell people, and this was easier before the internet, but I always tell people to go home and hug your zoning ordinance. Because the zoning ordinance is the least loved document in the entire village. Because what do people think when they open up the zoning ordinance? What, what does the zoning ordinance scream at them? No! Right? It screams no. Can I build an eight foot high fence? No. Can I build my house 36 feet tall? No. Can I put my garage? No. Right? So it's seen as the book of no. 
But really what it's meant to do is it's meant to create predictability. So it's not about telling you, no, you can't do something. It's about telling you, no, your neighbor is not going to build a house that's 40 feet tall, unless that's what the zoning says. Uh, and your neighbor's not going to build a 10-foot electrified barbed wire fence. Right? It creates predictability for neighbors. And that's really its purpose. It's not saying no. It's, in effect, almost a promise to the community that says, you know what, these are the rules that people are going to build by. These are the rules development's going to happen by. And if the rules are going to vary, because they will, because there's no right answer, we're going to have a process for, do it, for doing it, and your voice will be heard. That's the bottom line with the zoning ordinance. Just, just keep that in mind. Right, go ahead. Um, so these are the specific things, though, that it regulates in doing that. And you know what these are. It's about what kinds of land uses can be located where, what can their heights and setbacks be, how much of the land can you cover, that sort of thing. Again, that's the technical side of it. And I don't want to spend so much time in terms of the technical side as I do what are we trying to accomplish it. Um, staff will help manage the technical side. Uh, we're hoping our discussion is more about the intent of it. Um, and again, the typical zoning districts um, is about separating all these kinds of things. We've kind of talked about this. Um, but again, same with the zoning ordinance. Right? Every zoning ordinance is different. The kinds of lot sizes that are appropriate in one town, not necessarily in the other. Um, so the zoning ordinance needs to be a tool that is very specific to your community. It should follow what your comprehensive plan says. Here's what we're trying to accomplish. The zoning ordinance is a terrific way to do that, to preserve all sorts of character providing elements. Um, and so around here, right, we're talking about open space and how big are the lots going to be. And these are all things that get implemented in the zoning ordinance. You know this, so we'll touch on it. If anybody wants to ask a question, um, go ahead and slow me down. But um, the types of things that you, you see, um, the types of amendments or changes to the zoning ordinance, uh, there's the text amendment, which is changing what the rules are for any given district or, or, or all of the districts. Um, this is if somebody comes before you and thinks that your ordinance is not appropriate given what they want to do in a commercial district. And I'll give you a great example. Uh, when I was community development director in Highland Park, we used to have um, a dog grooming as a special use, as a conditional use in the business districts. Um, because dog grooming should be a conditional use, right? Because conditional uses have potentially adverse impacts, and everybody knows that dogs have potentially adverse impacts. I don't have to get too specific here, do I? Um, that's, this is the glamorous work that we all do. Um, but we had a guy come to us and say, hey, you know what? My site is perfect. It's great. It's so out of the way. It's not going to bother anybody. I want you to do a text amendment to change the, the B4 zoning district to allow these as a permitted use. And we said, hold on, Joe, because his name was Joe. Um, if we change it for your site by changing the text of the zoning ordinance, it applies to every property in the B4 district. So that's, what, that's the important thing to keep in mind about the text amendment. It's this sort of what's good for the goose is good for the gander version of it, right? Um, a map amendment applies to one specific site. So if Joe had said, you know what, my property is zoned B4, I'd like you to change it to B5 because in B5 you can have these uh, dog grooming places as a, uh, as a permitted use. Um, the map amendment is interesting because the map amendment actually has one of the highest thresholds for granting. Right? So if somebody comes before you and says, you know what, um, I've been zoned R4, I really want to be zoned R6 now. The, the thinking that's to be applied is really among the highest threshold. Why, why do you think that might be? Because the people who live next door have an expectation of the R4. So if you're going to change it to R6, there's got to be a good reason for it. And the neighbors have to be heard. And any adverse impacts need to be mitigated. So changing the map, um, again, from a technical reason, we're talking about spot zoning. You don't want to create small areas of zoning. But keep in mind why it's important. It's important because it's a change. And change is hard for people. I did have one um, map amendment once. I was in Mount Prospect, actually. And it was a vacant property that people lived around. And some guy wanted to come and put townhouses on it. It wasn't a half decent plan or a half bad plan. Oops, slip of the mind. Um, but we had people come out. And this one nice lady, she stood up and she said, she lived right next to the site. She said, you know, when I bought this property, my realtor told me that this property would be vacant forever. And she was really mad. And um, we all just kind of went, well, 
you know, that, but that was her expectation. And what we were doing, we were changing that. Right? So that's, that's how these things happen. That's why map amendments are so, need to be so carefully done. We'll go ahead and advance it. When you look at the hierarchy of zoning or how complicated are some of these things that you're asked to do, um, if I'm a property owner and I want to do a development, I really hope that I'm a permitted use, right? That the dog grooming place that I want to build is a permitted use. All I got to do is come into the village, get a building permit, uh, and meet all the other requirements, and I can go ahead. Um, I may need a variation. If I'm building a new building and I need, absolutely need to be closer to the property line, and Lori will talk about this in a bit, um, then I'm required to have a hearing. Um, I might be a special use. Um, and again, my, my um, example of the, the dog groomer aside, special use is, is a, a powerful tool in zoning because it's a use or an activity that in and of itself is not a bad thing or wrong for the corridor, um, but it requires a higher level of review and potentially some conditions to be applied to it. Um, gas stations are great examples. drive throughs are great examples. These are the kinds of things that create potential hazards for the community, and they need to come before the commission. They need an extra level of review from staff uh, before they're a good idea. Um, and then the highest level of review is, is a planned development, where there's um, essentially a fair amount of negotiation that can take place in terms of getting to the final development plan. We get asked a lot about conditions. Um, can we put conditions on an approval for a special use? Can we put them on a variation? Um, and, and our answer, our short answer is always, well, yes, you can. Um, you're authorized to put conditions on variations. But it's important to keep in mind that the conditions need to be um, in scale and reasonable given the request that's being made. Right? So if there's a drive-through restaurant that's coming before you and the, um, the, the ordering station for the Starbucks or the McDonald's or whatever, um, is near a residential area, um, it's perfectly reasonable to place conditions on it that um, the volume be turned down or that the box be turned away from the neighborhood uh, or that there be bushes planted so that the headlights don't shine light in between or, you know, from the drive through um, It's not reasonable to ask for them to put in a new stoplight three miles, at, three miles away to a different subdivision, right? There's got to be what the lawyers call this rational nexus a connection between the relief that's being requested and the condition that's being placed. Um, the planning and development, we just want to talk about uh, a little bit more because it's, it's a, a very flexible tool. Uh, and the idea is that there's a benefit to the developer who gets some flexibility in dealing with the um, requirements of the code from the standpoint of setback or bulk or height. Um, but there's also a benefit to the community, that there's some public benefit, uh, that it's not just saying, well, all right, we're willing to, to change the rules. Um, sometimes it's something as straightforward as just a, a higher quality design, uh, a better development. Um, but there should be something that um, is preserved or provided to the benefit of the community. Right. Um, annexation agreements. Do we have annexation agreements currently? Mm -hmm. Um, so an annexation agreement is, a, again, a very powerful tool. What, what the village essentially does is say to folks that are not yet in the village, hey, when you connect to the village, um, this is effectively how it's going to work. And there's a lot of flexibility uh, in the annexation agreements. And they, um, they become very powerful tools because it gives you, it gives you the, the expectation of what the development's going to be. Which is terrific, because you know that when you're looking at other developments in the area, well, here's what's going to be at this intersection, because they're not in the village yet for any number of reasons. But we have an annexation agreement, so we collectively understand that when it is in the village, you know, we may not know exactly what it'll look like, but we know what kind of use it will be, or we'll know what density or what height it will be. Um, these are great tools for looking, um, looking beyond uh, the boundaries to help plan. Subdivision regulations. Um, subdivision regulations, and you kind of see what, what's key to it here, um, it operates with the zoning and the building code. I mean, it's, a, uh, it's, it's one of the important tools in your, in your toolbox. Um, it's got a lot of technical procedures in it. It's a very administrative kind of section. Um, and there's, there's a lot, uh, 
there's a lot that goes through it. Mike, can we go to the next slide? Um, but at its heart, it, it does these sorts of things. Regulates the division of land, um, what are boundaries of properties, and so on. Uh, but again, in the interest of focusing on the big picture rather than the gory details, um, which, which your staff will, will manage, there's really a couple of things that the subdivision code does. One is, um, well, from this administrative standpoint, it, it controls the division of land. Um, but it sets up a lot of the process for how development happens. And that gets to that predictability question for the development community and the predictability uh, for the municipality. So it sets up the order in which infrastructure gets built, when do the roads get built, when do the sewers get put in, um, and then when can the developer have the building permit. So there's, there's a procedural aspect of it. But there's also a, a community character aspect of it because the subdivision code spells out how wide are different kinds of streets going to be. Are there going to be sidewalks? Are there going to be bike paths? What are the requirements that as new land is subdivided and developed, uh, what elements is it going to have or not have? Right? Do we want sidewalks? Do we not want sidewalks? It creates a very different character uh, and it's very, um, very important to a lot of communities. Again, no right answer. But this code is an important place for where that gets spelled out. Um, building and sign codes. Building code in particular is something that's going to be addressed um, by, the, uh, by the staff. These are, these are life safety codes. Uh, these are codes that uh, have got more to do with how the, how the structure is built than really the siting and the kinds of things that planning commissions uh, will typically deal with. Um, signs, signs are a lot of fun. Um, signs are very important to the business community. They're very important from an economic development standpoint. They are truly a First Amendment issue. Um, and I think some of the more entertaining disputes I've had as community development director have been over signs. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that doesn't ever happen to you. Um, because there's this balance between community character uh, and, and the ability of a, a business person to, to advertise their business. Um, and it is a constant struggle? I don't know about struggle. Um, it's a constant balancing act. And we can talk about it um, and swap stories. But um, again, it's very necessary for commerce. It's very necessary for maintaining the character of your community. I would suggest to you that the two most important elements of maintaining the character of your community are the kinds of things that get regulated, signs and landscaping. And again, we can talk about those later. Um, so, any questions on any or all of that? That's sort of the whirlwind, here's the codes, here's the ordinances, here's how we use them. Um, if nothing else, it should either make you feel comfortable or concern you that there's so many damn rules that are out there uh, to help you and the staff manage the community. But any questions? Uh, we want to, we'll keep going, um, but we want to get into some of those uh, other notions that we talked about in terms of roles of commissions and, and how to deal with meetings, how to run meetings, and I'm going to turn you over to Lori for that. As Michael said earlier, please feel free to get up and get coffee, cookies, go to the restroom. We don't take a break, but we don't like to see yes, uh, ahead. ask Michael a question, just that if there's going to be some follow-up when you're talking about um, the uh, uh, develop uh, as far as uh, annotations, agreements. Um, one thing that in the past we've talked about uh, the, the, uh, the real important thing was the facility, the facility planning areas mm -hmm. for sewage. Sure. And um, maybe I don't know if you were going to discuss it later about how it's tied to or how much influence maybe that adjacent village has on the FPA and. Um, just annexation of, of certain areas or uh, it, it seems to have controlled things around here as far as that type of thing. Certainly the FPAs do um, and also I think someone had said you do have boundary agreements um, which is something that you, you as a village enter into voluntarily with one of the other communities that you know surround you with the understanding of, you know, this part of this area that's unincorporated, um, when it gets to the point that will be incorporated, will go to this community. This other part of this area, when it gets to be the time to incorporate, will go to this other community. 
And, and the purpose of having those boundary agreements is so that you don't get into these crazy wars that happen with a developer playing off one community against the other and um, just getting into things that really are not helpful to any of the municipalities. I don't know if you want to. I was going to say, you know, the facility planning area question is, is a good one because you're right because it, it, it becomes kind of an absolute control on, on what you can do and, and where you can grow. Um, you know, I, I'll tell you personally, my experience with them is, is kind of limited, um, but, but where I've been involved, um, what it does is it emphasizes the need to um, look at those things as far out in advance as possible and, and to work with other communities. Um, because if not, you're right, they, they do kind of put up a wall to what you may want to, where you may want to be developing. Yeah, yes, and then and, uh, and being able to provide them with services that, and then uh, yeah, being forced to actually tie into those services or not tie into those services. Yeah, it, it becomes it becomes kind of an absolute, and it's not it's not part of the discussion that we have. But um, later on, we can get into that in a little more detail if you'd like. Okay. Great. And the idea is obviously that you want to, um, for any type uses, that wherever they're going to decide to incorporate, that that particular jurisdiction does have the ability to provide them with sewer and water. Um, and that it makes sense for them to go to that municipality rather than, than another one. So, um, okay. So, what is your role as the planning commission? Um, you are the really the only body here in the village that um, is the big picture group, and by that I mean your big picture and that you look at the community as a whole. Um, obviously there are times you're looking at a parcel of land and you're also a big picture because you're looking at the community over a longer time frame and, the, and that's a luxury that most of the other boards and commissions don't have so it's really important that you keep that in mind as, as part of your role um, and, and you're also the keeper of the village vision the community character all of those aspects of the community that nobody else really has much time or jurisdiction to look at. So think about that in terms of your ongoing role. Um, in terms of you as the commission as a whole as well as individuals, you know, it's important that you stay informed on what's going on here locally as well as um, other trends on, on planning issues, on development issues. Staying current on planning tools and techniques. Um, the state chapter of APA has an annual conference every year, this particular year. It will be in Chicago. We keep the um, uh, registration fees low if you're a member of a plan commission. It's in September this year. Um, so think about that. We know it's hard um, you know, to get away from your work for a day, work or family obligations, but it, it can be very valuable if, if you can attend. And the other thing that's, that's incredibly useful is after a, a particular project has been through the commission, has gotten approved by the village board, um, has been built and occupied, go back and take a look at it. Is it functioning the way you thought it was going to function? Um, are the drive-through lanes and the internal circulation on the site working well? Or is it causing, for whatever reason, backup on the public streets? Is the landscaping doing what it was supposed to do? Some of it may be landscaping for aesthetics. Some may be landscaping to buffer adjoining um, residential uses, perhaps. So look at those things so that the next time you get a similar development of that type, you can say, gee, a year or two ago, we had a similar development, and we did thus and so, and it worked out really well, and we want to do that again. Or, we had this project and it didn't work out so well and we want to make sure we don't mis make that mistake again. So actually going out and seeing the projects after they're built can be very helpful. The role of the elected officials, obviously they are looking at a lot of other different things than you get involved with. They're looking at budgets, they're looking at personnel, they're looking at risk management, they're looking at all of these other things, um, but they do provide you as commission members broad policy direction, um, both in terms of the comp plan, the zoning ordinance, 
or other more specific things that come along. Um, you're a recommending body, so the village board makes the final decision. Um, the other really important thing that the village board does is to appoint qualified members to the planning commission when you have a vacancy. So that's real critical to the ongoing function functioning of the plan commission. So here in Homer Glen, you've got two other commissions that might sometimes be related to something that you're working on. Environmental is one, and Parks and Rec is another mm -hmm. one. We just put these up so that you're aware that there's other groups that are out there that may sometimes be thinking about some of the same issues you're thinking about. It's up to staff to kind of coordinate that and make sure that there's not duplication or overlap um, or, or worse conflict. So we just kind of want you to think about that. Other jurisdictions, we have a huge laundry list up here. Um, obviously schools, parks, libraries, other municipalities, townships, your county, your forest preserve district, CMAP, which we'll talk about in a minute. There's a laundry list, an uh, alphabet list of both state and federal agencies. Again, they're not necessarily something as commissioners that you will directly get involved with, but your staff will. If you've got a particular issue coming up, they may have to coordinate with IDOT if it's a state road on location of curb cuts, for example. Um, so there are those other jurisdictions out there that are related to some of those things that you do, but as a general rule, it will be your staff that's coordinating with them. So CMAP um, is the regional planning agency for the seven county Chicago area. Um, we've listed up there some of the things that they are focused on, transportation, um, land use, um, air and water issues. Um, they have a current plan that's the go-to 2040 plan. Uh, later this month, they're going to be kicking off a new plan, which is going to be the 2050 plan. Um, it was, CMAP was created 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago now, and it was the first time the Chicago area had one regional body that was looking at both land use and transportation. Before 2005, there, there was NIPSI, the North Northeastern Illinois Planning Commission and CATS, the Chicago Area Transportation Study, which was obviously the transportation group, but they were completely separate. So we now have a much better um, way of handling regional issues because everything is in one jurisdiction. Um, the important distinction that you need to know about CMAP as a regional agency versus Homer Glen as a local government is CMAP on land use issues is only a recommending body, whereas Homer Glen has jurisdiction to make decisions and um, approve or disapprove and directly regulate, which CMAP cannot do. However, CMAP does a bunch of other really helpful things to municipalities. They provide technical assistance, the local technical assistance program that um, Mike referred to before. They also do best practices. There's case studies, um, model plans, model ordinances. Um, they have um, a lot of data that's available on their website. Um, and we'll have one slide, one or two slides at the end, which lists resources. And virtually everything on CMAP's website is free um, to use. So it's, it's a great resource to use as you're going forward as members of the commission. So working with the media, um, every community is different on media. Some communities only want the village president or the village staff to speak to the media. Other communities say no, it's okay for members of the planning commission to speak to the media. Um, just be sure you know what the village policy is. And also when you're talking to the press, make it clear to the press if you're speaking as a resident who happens to also be a member of the Planning Commission or if you're speaking in your official capacity as a member of the Planning Commission. And, <coughs> excuse me, if you're speaking in your official capacity as a member of the Planning Commission, just stick to the facts, what the case was about, what the evidence was, and what the Planning Commission decided, what your recommendation of the Village Board is. If you're speaking as a resident, 
you can um, state your own personal opinion, but don't blur what you're saying as a resident with your role as planning commission. And the other thing when you're dealing with the media, you know, repeat, 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 just to make sure that the reporter is clear on what you're saying. Um, anything you say to a reporter may be on the front page of the local newspaper, you know, the next day. So you just want to be sure that they understand and get what it is you're trying to communicate. So the village planner obviously has an important role in, this in the whole process. Um, they provide a lot of technical assistance to the planning commission and to the village board. They're also an interface with the citizens, with the residents. So they have a role to work with both the developer that's going through the process and working with them on what the process is and what the requirements are and what the procedures are, but by the same token to provide that same information to any individual residents that, that come in and have questions about a particular case. Um, the role of the staff is to, at a public hearing, and sometimes a resident that doesn't understand, that's never attended a public hearing before, might get confused on this, but the staff will explain the applicant's request, say what it's about, or is it up to the applicant to advocate for their particular request? And sometimes a resident may feel because the plan, the village planner got up and said something about it that they're advocating for. It. So it's important that that distinction be made. Okay. Staff report, um, obviously background and the information that you need to help you arrive at your decision. The zoning requirements for, Kate, for the particular case, the relationship to the comprehensive plan. Um, does the staff generally make a formal recommendation in the written plan? We do. Okay. Um, and the other thing that can be very helpful for you as a commission is um, to look at what staff is saying and also if it's a particular case, staff may have some suggested conditions that you put on the approval if you decide to approve a particular case. Um, which is not to say that you might, because of the testimony that's offered at a on a particular case, there might be one or two other conditions you want to add, which is fine. But it, it can be helpful for you as lay people to have that recommendation from the staff and their conditions as you're going through and hearing the evidence. Okay, who, who else is involved? Obviously the petitioner. They have to come to you with complete information, current information, and accurate information. And they, if it's a complex, complex case, they may also bring expert witnesses with them to the hearing. It may be a traffic engineer, it may be a civil engineer, um, their architect, an appraiser, um, whatever it is that's necessary for that um, particular case. So they need to be prepared, their team, to answer any of your questions that you have about the particular case. Um, and once in a while something will come up at a hearing where there's a question that comes up um, that no one had anticipated before the hearing. And the staff can't answer it, the petitioner can't answer it, the petitioner's experts can't answer it. In that case, it's perfectly acceptable for the plan commission, you as the plan commission, to continue the case until you have the information that you need to make a decision. We don't suggest you use this or abuse this ability willy-nilly, but certainly to continue it to a date certain, to allow the petitioner time to come back with the information that you need to make an informed decision on the case. The public's role to come to listen, to ask questions, to comment um, on the particular case, and we hope they're also courteous to everyone in the room that night. So, when you're coming and getting ready to go to the meeting, make sure you've read everything that comes from staff. We know that you're volunteers, that you have jobs and family and other civic responsibilities, and sometimes it's hard to read the packet, particularly if it's a big one, before the meeting. Um, to, if at all possible, to visit the site. Um, 
you'll get a lot of information from your staff and from the applicant, um, site plans and elevations and plans of surveys and things like that, um, which are very helpful, but there's no substitute to actually seeing it 3D um, with your own eyes. And sometimes all you may be able to do is to drive by the site the night of the hearing, and that's okay. Um, that, that's better than not actually having seen the site at all. And we also encourage you, if you have questions, if possible, to call the staff ahead of time. Um, if you may ask a question at the hearing, which is very easy for staff to answer. They have the information at their fingertips and can give you the information um, that you need. Or it may be something that they need to do a little bit of research on, um, either in the village archives or some other form of research. And so if you can give them uh, a day or two notice of what your question is so that they can um, come prepared with the answers that you need. Um, and at the hearing itself, to obviously listen, to ask questions of um, both the applicant and anyone that might be there to speak in opposition. Make sure you understand, obviously, what, they're, um, what the applicant's proposing, how it relates to your comp plan. Um, we suggest that you do not debate the applicant or debate a member of the public. And by that I mean there's, you know, the time in the meeting for the applicant to speak, there's a time in the meeting for the public to speak, and certainly listen and ask questions. Um, but if you don't necessarily agree with what's been said, you don't necessarily need to get into it with them. Once the formal testimony part is over and closed, you, with all the other members of the plan commission, can discuss in open session, of course, what you've heard and how much you agree with it and how much weight you're giving to all the testimony you've heard and some of the testimony you may not give much weight to and that's that's perfectly okay um, and also any comments that you make during the public hearing um, make them on the record into the microphone so that everybody in the room um, can hear it you know you might want to lean over to the person next to you and say, gee, I've forgotten what the next date is of our next meeting, or something like that, or gee, can you give me a ride home, whatever it is. It may be something totally innocent, but a member of the public sitting here and watching you might wonder what that little side conversation is, and unfortunately we're here in Illinois where we um, have a reputation of Local government sometimes is not the most transparent. You know, our whole history of decision making in the back rooms that are smoke filled. So just be aware um, of, of how you're being perceived, even if, a, as I said, it's a perfectly innocent question you're directing to your seat mate. Just save it for when the, when the actual um, meeting is over. Okay, the chair. The chair is really the most important person in the room. Um, it's their responsibility to manage the meeting, manage the decorum of the meeting, manage the agenda. Um, it's really critical that everybody that comes to the hearing that has something to say leaves at the end of the night, regardless of whether they agreed with the decision or not, that they can leave at the end of the night feeling that they were heard. Um, so it's, it's important to allow people to speak and to say whatever it is that they have to say. Um, and certainly if something comes up where you need the input of the village attorney or corporation council, um, ask them or have staff ask them because they're there as a resource for you. Okay, questions, comments? Anything I said that you don't agree with or that you didn't understand? And, uh, uh, the uh, idea of asking questions for staff beforehand is really good. I mean, mm -hmm. that one or two days would be really nice to have. I think it's going to be more like one or two hours. If <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, that's, that's a good thing uh, to keep in mind. Uh, and it'll probably make things go smoother at the meeting also. Right, exactly. And, you know, it's something may have occurred to you at the hearing itself where you just didn't think of it ahead of time. And, and that's okay. You know, we're not saying, oh, if something comes up at the hearing, you can't ask the question. It's just if you 
if you've read through the material and you've thought of something, gee, what about this, that you, that you call staff ahead of time if possible. Should I keep going? Okay. Robert's rules, um, the way Robert's rules should be used is to make a hearing efficient and effective. You can get into a lot of minutia with Robert's rules, which just totally ties up the process and slows things down. So just kind of look for that balance. Um, things like a quorum, that's already in your own rules anyway. A couple of types of, emo of motions, which may or may not be emotional. First is, the, is a main motion. So an example of that would be someone saying, I move that this development, XYZ development, be approved. Um, a subsidiary motion might be something where another commissioner says, um, I move that we approve the development but with the following condition or multiple conditions. So, um, you know, what you want to do is, is take, um, a, and by the way, anytime you have a motion, I'm sure you all know this, there has to be a second. If no one seconds the motion, the motion dies. Um, so on the su subsidiary motion, assuming it's been seconded, you're going to vote on it prior to the main motion. In other words, with the example I just gave, you would vote on the, motion, the subsidiary motion to add a condition first, and then you would go back and vote on the main motion, which was a motion to approve XYZ development. Um, also, in order for the chair to control the meeting and the flow of the meeting and the discussion, a motion can only be made if the chair has recognized you to speak, to speak or to make, a, uh, to make the motion. So just be aware of that. Um, we talked about uh, being recognized, having a second, and so forth. Uh, then depending on the type of motion it is, there will be discussion on it. Sometimes it's a routine motion and you ju just go directly to a vote. Um, when it is something that you're going to be discussing, the person who has made the motion gets to speak first. Um, and then the other people on the commission get to speak, and the chair would make sure that everybody on the commission that wanted to speak has spoken, and then you go ahead and, and you would take the vote. Um, and then amendments, similar to what I discussed before about a subsidiary motion, that's how you would handle um, an amendment. Uh, friendly amendment, kind of the same thing. Um, calling the question is basically moving the question that was on the table, that you want to take a vote on it. Um, if, if you want to do that, um, you need that particular motion requires a two-third vote. The other motions require just a majority vote. Um, to reconsider a matter, which would, is supposed to happen at the same hearing that you took the original vote on, um, and it has to be made by the person, by a person, that voted on the prevailing side. The side that, you know, five to three, you voted to approve something. So someone wants to reconsider it. It has to be one of those five people that voted to approve it, not one of the three that voted um, to deny it. Okay, tabling. I <coughs> talked a little bit about continuing a case. Tabling, don't use it to just kind of ignore something and, you know, put it, put it away um, where you're not going to deal with it. You really need, in fairness to the petitioner and to the people that come to the meeting, you need to take action, if not at this particular hearing at a, at a subsequent one. Um, but there may be a reason to table it because you need more information, for example. That's a perfectly acceptable thing to do. Um, and uh, if someone wants to object to continuing the discussion on something um, when it's already been moved and you've, you're going into deliberation, um, you need to postpone something indefinitely and that needs a majority vote. If it's been moved but you haven't yet started talking about it, um, in order to table that, um, 
it needs a two-thirds vote to, to table it in that particular instance. Um, let's go on to the next one. Okay, taking testimony. The point of testimony is to get all the evidence, pro and con, that you as commissioners need to make your decision whether you want to approve a particular project that's in front of you or not. Um, and you want to make sure that everybody, as I said before, feels that they have been heard. Um, this is a typical way that um, meetings are run. Each municipality may run it slightly different. We recommend that at the, begin at the beginning of every meeting, um, where, where it's a public hearing and you have people in the audience, you have to understand that most of those residents have probably never been to a public hearing with the Planning Commission in their life. They have no idea what to expect. And so it's very good if at the beginning of the meeting you can explain the process, things like, you know, the petitioner, the applicant will, protect, will present their case. They may have witnesses that will also be allowed to speak that in a complicated case may go on for a, quite a while. So someone sitting in the audience that's never been to a public hearing before may think, well, the residents are never going to get a chance to speak. This is a done deal. Why did I waste my time in coming? But if they've been told when the meeting starts, the thing that's going to happen in the beginning is the applicant and the applicant's team will be presenting their case. That's just the way it works. Um, but they know that eventually they and the other residents that came to attend the hearing to speak will get their turn. Um, one thing that often happens is um, people will do a couple of things. They'll speak on something that's not really relevant to the standards of review, which you have to use in making your decision. They may say something like, well, this guy's been a bad neighbor, his property has been vacant for a long time, and he's never cut the weeds. Um, and, and a response to some comment like that is, would be something along the lines of, thank you for your interest. We will pass that issue along to staff who will be responsible for following up on the weeds issue, but that's not something as a plan commission that we get into. So you want to be sure that the person has felt that their comment has been heard, but you've also been very clear with them that that's not what you do as plan commission members. The other thing that comes up is that you may have a person that's repeating themselves and hasn't really added anything new to the conversation and to try and kind of gently ask them if they have anything else new to say. Or you may have a series of speakers that say the same thing, that if this project is built and the location is proposed, it's going to be very unsafe for school kids getting to school. And it's going to be dangerous. And at that point, you may say to the group that's in attendance, how many of you are concerned about the school kids getting to school safely? Please raise your hand. OK, show of hands. We've made a note that there's 20 people in the audience that are concerned about this. If that's the only thing that you were planning to say, it's not necessary for you to get up and say that, because we have this in the record. And that's to kind of cue them that, you know, don't get up and say the same thing. There will still be people that even though a bunch of other people have said that already on the record, and even though they raised their hands and were counted, they're still going to want to get up and state their name and say, I object to this because it's going to be dangerous for the school kids. If they want to do that, you know, you have to let them do that, but by kind of taking account of how many people are concerned about it, there will be some people in the audience that say, well, okay, that was really the only thing I have to say, so they're not going to get up and come to the podium. Um, the, <clears throat> the best thing is, both from a public policy and from a legal issue, is to allow more testimony rather than less testimony. A village can get into trouble, and there have been court cases in Illinois on this, if you are limiting the testimony of anybody on any side of the issue. Um, so you don't want to be in a position where you've done that. Um, from a legal perspective, it can result in the case being overturned uh, if somebody decides to take the village to court. 
The other reason, just from a public policy perspective, is people want to feel that they personally have been heard, and also they're sitting in the audience and they've watched other people come up who have had something to say, and that those other people, who may be total strangers to them, but they're residents of the village, they have been heard too. If they feel the plan commission is cutting off the comments of those other members of the public, it you know throws the whole process into a questionable light from the resident's perspective. So that's why we always say more testimony is better than less testimony. Yes, it makes the meetings long, and nobody likes to be here until midnight, but um, that's why we always say more testimony rather than less. Lori, do you want to just real briefly mention the cross-examination process? Um, communities do that differently. Some people, um, some communities handle it that if somebody's giving testimony, the um, say against the particular application, that um, the attorney for the applicant or the applicant themselves can cross-examine them. And um, that makes a typical resident very nervous, uncomfortable, but if, if that's your policy, you know, that's your policy. Or the same thing, they allow members of the public to cross-examine the applicant or the applicant's witness, witnesses, plural. Um, it, it can slow down a meeting. Um, if it's a fairly simple case, you know, to just ask that someone who has a question direct it to the chair and the chair can then ask the question of the person who's testifying, that can be the best way to handle it. Um, but sometimes in the larger, more complicated cases, the issue of cross-examination does come up and I don't know how you've handled it here in the past. Do you want yeah, you know what my experience has been is that if um, the best thing to do is to have a, a process spelled out for it. So if it's going to happen, people are doing it in a way that you expect and that the chair can control. Um, what we used to do is we used to have people um, would have to sign in in advance of doing it. So they couldn't all of a sudden stand up at the hearing and go, wait a minute, and you know, kind of interrupt the flow of what is essentially the, the commission's meeting. Um, and that they would be required had to read the, review the materials in advance, you had to come prepared, you had to literally sign in as a, as, what do we call it, objectioner or petitioner, whatever it was. Um, but you, ha you have to allow it, um, which is the result of the case that, that Laura was talking about, which is unfortunate because like you said, it does mess up the case. But we think the best thing to do is to spell out a procedure for it that folks have to follow so at least you get fewer surprises that way. Um, and this last bullet point it is very important. In, in a small community, a suburban community, we understand that some of the people that are coming out either to apply for something or to object to something, you're going to know them personally. Your kids go to school together, or you play golf together, or you see them in the grocery store, or you go to the same place of worship. So it can be very difficult to vote against what is perceived as the majority of the sentiment in the room. We need to recognize two things. Um, people who don't care or who support the application are far less likely to come to a hearing than people that have a problem with it. And even apart from that, as a commission, your obligation is to vote based on the standards of review and the testimony and the written material and so forth that you've been presented. So it can, we understand it's not easy to go against, you know, a, a group of very vocal people that are in the room on any given evening. But the number of people for something <coughs> and people against something are not the reason that you have to vote one way or the other. You have to vote based on the testimony and the standards of review. Okay, findings of fact. This is, this is what you're going to use um, in your decision making. Um, the, obviously, the consistency with the comprehensive plan is very important. And the other thing that comes up a lot is the issue of setting a precedent. Um, 
if you have made a decision on a case that is similar in the past, you need to make the same decision if you have a similar case in front of you, unless there are things that distinguish the cases. It may have been the other case was so long ago that circumstances have completely changed. There may be things on the surface of it that make the two cases seem similar, but they really aren't, and that's been brought forth in the testimony. So that if you're going to vote a different way than these apparently superficially similar case was a couple of years ago, you need to be very clear that you've gotten on the record all those things that make tonight's case different from the case two or three years ago. So that, that's just important in terms of precedent or no precedent. So the LaSalle factors, um, this has, goes back to a case 60, approximately 60 years ago. It was in Cook County. Um, all in the cell bank. Um, but it's important in Illinois because the Illinois Supreme Court made a finding that zoning in Illinois is constitutional as long as it's not arbitrary and capricious. So this is a similar case to the Euclid case that Michael mentioned earlier that was a U.S. Supreme Court case. So the, so the, the idea that zoning is okay to do, it's something that you, the, you as a village has the authority to do. So this goes back to 1957. Um, and it goes on to say that um, it must be related to the public health safety um, issues. That's the police power that has been delegated to you um, from the state. And so the standards of review that are in a typical zoning ordinance basically flow from that sale case. If you're um, having a problem getting to sleep one night, go to the internet and look at a bunch of zoning ordinances from all over the state. This is just what you want to do, right? But, but you will find the language in those different zoning ordinances are very similar. They're not identical, but they're very similar. And the reason being, it all goes back to these LaSalle factors and that court case and how attorneys and planners write zoning ordinances. Okay, so the LaSalle factors are things like, what are the surrounding uses surrounding a particular um, project you are discussing? What are the what's the zoning district? Um, property values, that's always something that you hear about, um, either from the applicant or from objectors, is, is what's the impact going to be on property values? Um, is, is this particular land that's being discussed really suitable for the use that's being proposed? If the applicant's argument is that the property has either been vacant, abandoned, underutilized for a period of time, how does that compare with other properties in the immediate neighborhood? For example, 15 years ago, the amount of time a property had been vacant might have been relatively short. But because of the Great Recession, you will probably have some applicants coming in front of you where you know they complain that well it's been vacant for a year well what about the properties around it because of the great recession everything may have been vacant for five years or whatever the magic number is so you need to weigh that in the context of what's gone around um, in, in the area around it uh, can you go back one more um, the issue kind of in three and four is a balancing between the applicant and the applicant's property rights and the impact on immediately joining neighbors or um, property owners in the vicinity in the neighborhood and you know there's there's no there's no perfect case where it's a hundred percent win-win for everybody but there's a way of balancing that so you're allowing maybe some underlying change, whether it's a variation or special use, that you're giving to the property owner um, and mitigating that perhaps with conditions so that it protects the owners within the greater neighborhood. So it's, it's always that balancing act that you as a commission have to look at. Okay, special uses. These 
types of uses are things that are not bad, that they may be things that the village will want, but they may have some um, implications that need to be looked at. A drive-through bank, a drive-through fast food thing. You know, there's traffic implications. It's not that the bank in and of itself is bad or a fast food restaurant in and of itself is bad, but so those are the types of things, gas stations are another um, use that sometimes is a special use, and you know, Michael mentioned the, um, uh, the dog issue, dog wash issue. Um, so there's a variety, every community has a different list of special uses. So um, they're, they're given special treatment in the zoning ordinance, they are not a permitted use, so they have to come before you for the public hearing. Um, and then this um, list of the sorts of things that you can impose in the way of conditions, signs, lighting, landscaping, um, parking issues, certain performance standards, any of those are perfectly okay in terms of conditions that you have the ability to impose on a particular special use. So this slide and the next slide is language that's taken directly from your zoning ordinance here in Homer Glen, and it talks about the things that you need to look at when you're looking at a special use. So the first one is this issue that we've already talked about, health, safety, morals, comfort, or general welfare. Um, the um, uh, other others, things like uh, property values, which we've talked about, um, that the particular use is desirable use to have in the community here in Homer Glen, um, and that uh, it will, if the use is approved and goes into that particular site, that it's not going to have an, a, an adverse effect on development or redevelopment of adjoining properties or properties in the neighborhood. Um, we kind of touched on that one, it's a little bit similar to what I just mentioned. Uh, you want to be sure that there's adequate utilities, that the drainage, the stormwater management as proposed is sufficient or that you're going to condition it if you want um, a little bit higher standard. Um, ingress and egress on the public streets, that's very critical. Um, and, and the last one is about um, the goals of the comp plan. And let me go up to the second one that's listed there. This particular standard is, um, as it's written, is unique to Homer Glen. Um, so what does it say? It talks about the exterior architectural appeal and functional plan is not at variance with the structures um, in the neighborhood. Um, that it will not substantially depreciate the surrounding structures. So that's saying not only are we looking at the land use and for the bank we're looking at the drive-through and the ingress and egress and are we causing a, public, uh, causing a problem on the public streets, but also the building itself. Is, is that going to work? Is that um, compatible with the surrounding areas and is, is it going to work? So that's, that's one other thing that that you have as a standard that you need to look at. We'll go to the next one. Okay, variations. Um, variations are also require um, a hearing by the plan commission. These are things that need relief from the zoning ordinance um, in order to be approved. Um, and, and typically what you're looking at is um, things like a particular hardship as opposed to simply an inconvenience to the property owner. Um, and this issue of use variances, that's a uh, not <coughs> recommended. If someone is coming in front of you and saying, gee, I want a variation on the use, the answer should be no. They need to either do a text amendment or a map amendment, which Michael discussed earlier. You don't want to get in the habit of making a variance from from what your ordinance says are permitted uses in the district. And that goes back to the whole issue that was mentioned earlier about the neighbors want um, some predictability and some protection for their property from willy-nilly changes in the zoning ordinance. 
Okay, again, these um, standards that we have listed on the slide are taken from your ordinance and um, the handout which has a, a little bit of green on the cover. Um, towards the back of that handout is we have taken each standard for special use and then each standard for a variation and given you a hypothetical example of the type of case that would meet that particular standard. So it's just something um, to think about as you're thinking about cases going forward. We, we won't discuss the handout tonight, but I just wanted to point that out to you. So for variations, um, you want to look at the particular physical property of the lot. Um, is it, it's shaped, is there any topographical, are other unique conditions that relate to the lot, not to the human applicant, but to the lot itself. Um, you know, is it an odd-shaped lot? Um, is it something about the lot itself? The topography presents um, a difficulty in doing a conforming addition to an existing house, for example. Those are the sorts of things that you want to look at for that standard. Um, that the conditions for this particular lot are not conditions that you're going to find widespread in the zoning district that this particular lot is in, that it's something unique. Um, that it, the purpose of the variation is not based exclusively on a desire to make more money from the particular property. And this is something that you will hear anywhere in Chicago or, or Illinois, a developer comes in and says to you, well, I paid this much for the property, and because I paid X, I need to get a certain number of single-family lots in the subdivision, or a certain number of multifamily units on the lot, or whatever it is. You know, not to be unsympathetic, but that's just too darn bad. He or she bought the property with knowledge of what the zoning ordinance allowed. Mm -hmm. So they should have done one or two things. is negotiated a price with the seller that recognized realistic expectations for the amount of lots in the subdivision based on the zoning ordinance. Or if the developer wanted, thought there was a, a rational reason why he could convince the village to allow more lots, he should have done some kind of contractual arrangement and not actually close on the property, but entered into agreement with the seller that the final closing on the property would be contingent on the developer getting the number of units, the number of lots that, that he wished. So um, they can't use just that argument to force you to grant a variation. Um, the, the next one is um, the difficulty or hardship has not been caused by someone who currently owns the property. So if someone, um, say, 30 years ago, before your ordinance, your zoning ordinance, had built a house on the lot that's now, because of your ordinance, that house is in a non-conforming location. But it's not owned by the original owner, it's owned by a subsequent purchaser. So they didn't cause the location to be in a non-conforming place. So that would be reason, assuming all the other conditions are granted, are, are met, that would be reason to allow that to happen. Okay? Next one. Um, public welfare, we've talked about that one. Um, the bottom one has a whole long list. Air, supply of air to neighboring properties, not increasing the danger of fire, um, endangering public safety and property values. Um, <coughs> remember some of those photographs at the beginning that Michael showed you of the tenements in New York City and how those properties were so close together and how it was very difficult for the fire department when there was a fire on any of those buildings to adequately fight the fire. And some of you have probably heard about the Triangle Factory fire going back a 
long time ago. Um, and the huge loss of life. So this issue of, of air and um, being able to make sure properties are safe from fire, you know, goes back to the beginning of zoning ordinance, but it's, it's still a concern today. Um, and then the middle one is the one we just talked about in terms of special use, excuse me, special uses, about the um, appearance, um, architectural feel of the, the new project that is proposed and how it relates to the surrounding um, neighborhood. Okay, I've covered a lot. What comments or questions do you have on what we've gone over so far? I have a question about the precedence. When you said that you know you have to pay attention to something that was happened a few years ago. Well, what if it was a bad decision by administration? You know, and and that's why. You know, you get a new administration comes in, and I mean, do you have grounds for changing, or do you have to follow that precedence? Mm. One argument that you might be able to use in that case is enough time has passed that conditions have changed, um, and that that's why the decision five years ago was to approve it, that the decision this year can be not to approve it. Um, and that's a tricky one in terms of, you know, there's been different elected officials and so forth. Um, but to try and find something in looking at those two cases that really distinguishes them. They're, they're not identical. The neighbors are different. The neighborhood is different. Or how one will function versus the other one, how the other one function something that can distinguish them so the, so you as part of the village can say we're making a dis different decision and this is why and you know that's something that staff can help with um, in terms of their knowledge as professional planners and um, perhaps their institutional memory of, of why something happened or didn't happen or I, I would think you could almost even use the bad example as additional information or additional testimony as to why we, you know, we did that drive-through five years ago, and this one's just like it, but we've learned from this one. You know, that one almost becomes evidence of why you wouldn't do it the same. But, you know, yeah, like Lori says, the key is to create the distinction between them. <coughs> By the way, we're not attorneys, we don't give legal advice. So. <laughs> we're just planning. We're supposed to tell you that. Yeah, but th that's a really good point that Michael's making, is, is that you've learned from a bad example that was, for whatever reason, was approved, and, and now you don't want to do that again. One thing I want to mention, Lori, just quickly, is um, we have you know situations where we've inherited a lot of what happened in Will County that when we incorporated in 2001, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of, or thousands, if not hundreds, of uh, non-conforming situations. So we had a case recently that went before the plan commission and, and went to the board shortly thereafter. Uh, where someone was seeking a variation after the fact or a ratification of some non-conformities so that they ex could expand the footprint of the house. Um, so they just want to make the distinction that we have variances or variations that are um, before the fact. You know, somebody's asking for permission to do something and, and it doesn't meet the requirement. But we also have a lot of the, the other type, which is, you know, there's a non-conformity out there that pre-exists and they want to expand that house or that lot and um, we're sort of, it's a, I call it a ratification or an after the fact variation. Um, I don't know, you've probably dealt with these over the years. Yeah, it's, um, I mean if it's already there and they're not changing anything then it doesn't, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but you don't need to, you know, go through that step. But if it come if they're coming in front of you for something else, yeah, to say that um, this was allowed by Will County and we're going to recognize that um, and uh, I don't want to say how you word it if you say you're going to make it conforming or you're going to de facto grant a variation even you know, if it wasn't necessary to grant the variation when, when the particular piece of land was in Will County. 
um, but, but to recognize that fact. Um, and, and the other thing um, that I thought might, might be going in the direction is there may have been things that were approved in Will County that as the village of Homer Glen, you know, you don't agree with, you don't think it's appropriate, similar to what Michael was saying before, um, that you have learned from a particular issue, type of project that Will County has allowed that doesn't make sense to you as the village of Homer Glen, and then you're not going to allow it, you will, you will vote to deny it. So. I guess it's something along those lines. What, what I'm sure you're doing, which you may want to, at some point, kind of track which ones are you granting and which ones come up that you're like, no, that, that's not right. And to the extent there are some that you are granting, you may want to work towards find a way that you can either do those administratively, you know, find a process that's more straightforward to approve them so that it frees up your dock a little bit, frees up some staff time, and ultimately makes it easier for the residents. If they've got something that is we just call them no-brainers, right? I mean, this one's easy. Of course we're going to grant it. Um, you really should think of maybe you want to codify that process. Um, and the same thing, like Lori says, if there are some that just never work and are not the right thing to do, um, you know, you may want to do the same thing, but on the other side, identify why those should not be, um, be granted. Because I, I guess there's certain, cons over time, there's going to be some consistency between them. Right. And the other thing that happens a lot is um, as, t as you go through time, there are different development patterns in the community. So um, you may have homes that were built immediately after World War II, say, that are on perhaps smaller lots in the smaller homes because of that the setbacks may be narrower. Um, and then you have the lots that were built on in the last 10 years where the lots may be larger, the homes may be larger, the setbacks may be different. It's important that your underlying, underlying zoning recognize those two different development patterns, that you can't impose the requirements that are perfectly acceptable for the, the newer subdivisions, the larger lots, the larger homes. You can't just willy-nilly put them, those standards, on parts of the community that may be older and were built at a different time that pre-existed the village's incorporation in 2001. You know, so you need to be sure that you're, and this, this happens all over, um, it's not unique to Homer Glen, you need to be sure that your zoning ordinance recognizes those different development patterns and it doesn't make half of the, the houses that were built prior to incorporation non-conforming just because the houses that have been built since incorporation have much much bigger lots and much bigger setbacks. So just keep that in mind. Okay. So ex party means any type of contact that occurs outside the public hearing between members of the commission and anyone, whether it be um, the applicant or someone proposing it. So you want everything that you're voting on, all the information that you're using to make a decision has to be on the public record. Either it was testimony that was taken at the public hearing or it was written material that's available to the public um, that's part of the record. So if someone comes up to you, you're at the grocery store or whatever, and says, I hate what's being proposed, at such and such a property, you have to vote against it. And the response should be something along the lines of, I'm really glad you're interested. Please come to the hearing next Monday night and testify. Sometimes the person will say, I can't come, I don't wanna come, blah, 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 whatever they say. Then encourage them to send a letter or an email to staff. Staff can then distribute it to everybody so it's all part of the public record. And then say at the hearing, you know, Mr. Smith came up to me in the grocery store and shared his concern about this particular property. That way it's on the record, it's very clear that you had the conversation, and nobody says later, oh, well, this, there was this, you know, secret conversation that occurred at the supermarket. Um, it's a due process issue. Um, 
and it ultimately, in its worst case, could invalidate the village's decision. Um, the other thing to, that sometimes happens is that you're going out to the site to look at it, and you may be on foot, and someone may come up to you, it may be the applicant, it may be a neighbor, that says kind of the same thing I just described. Again, it's like, please come to the hearing or send, send an email or a letter to staff so it can be distributed so it's part of the public record. Ethics, um, there's a state statute that applies um, to ethical behavior by elected officials and appointed officials, which would include the plan commission. Um, basically, it looks at two things, gifts, and it looks at um, participation in political activities, meaning partisan political activities. Uh, I'm not gonna get into this, um, just be aware it's out there. Each municipality may have a slightly different interpretation of the state statute. So if you have any questions about it, you can ask your staff or have staff ask the village attorney. Conflicts of interest. Uh, a conflict of interest is a financial conflict. So um, if you have, if your sister-in-law is gonna open a restaurant in town if you're selling her the land, that's a conflict. If you're renting her the building, that's a conflict. If you're gonna be providing the food or beverage, that's a conflict. If you're selling her restaurant equipment or restaurant furniture, that's all a conflict of interest because you stand to gain financially from your sister-in-law getting the zoning approval necessary to open the restaurant. If your only benefit from your sister, if you're an employee, going to employ, that would be another conflict. If the only benefit you're going to get from her opening the restaurant is once a year you get a free pizza, um, that's a benefit, but it doesn't rise to the level of a financial conflict of interest. Um, stock ownership, we sometimes get this question. 1% um, is generally the rule of thumb. So if you own stock in Microsoft and they're coming to Homer Glen to open a facility, um, I think it's fair to say that most of us in the room probably do not own more than 1% in Microsoft, so that would not be a conflict of interest. However, if you are a majority shareholder in Microsoft, you would definitely have to disclose that interest and you would have to recuse yourself. Also think about the appearance of impropriety. Um, you may not have any financial um, gain, um, but there may be people that knows there's a relationship between you and an applicant, and in that case, we encourage you to disclose it at the beginning of the hearing, to say, I will not be involved in this new restaurant that's being proposed by my sister-in-law, um, and I am going to participate in the case. So that way, it's totally above board, it's been on the record, everybody is aware of it, and um, you can go ahead and participate. Uh, next slide. Um, so the disclosing is when there's not a conflict, the recusing is when you do have a conflict of interest and you need to leave the room for the entire case. In other words, from the time the case is called, through the testimony, through the voting, you should not be in the room for the entire length of that case. Once the case is over, there's another case on the agenda tonight, that's fine, come back into the room and participate. But you need to be out of the room if you're recusing yourself. So there are some things that are not a conflict of interest. If um, there's going to be a new zoning ordinance that's going to be voted on, that's something that applies to everyone in the community. Obviously, it applies to your own property, but that's not a conflict of interest. Or things like amendments to the zoning ordinance, that's not a conflict. If an organization that you're a member of um, is having um, some case before the planning commission, that they're expanding their parking lot, so it's going to make it easier, you, easier for you to find a parking space. Or they're expanding the sanctuary, so it will be easier for you to find a seat um, for the religious service. That's not a conflict of interest. It's, it's a nice little um, benefit that you're getting, but it's not, not a financial conflict. You do not need to um, recuse yourself in, um, in that sort of situation. <coughs> Excuse me, if it's a neighbor, 
if it's someone that you golf with or someone that you're in book club with or something you coach little league any of those things um, those aren't conflicts of interest yes you have a relationship but it's not a financial conflict if you want to say at the beginning of the case you know I know this person but there's no financial conflict that's up to you if you want to go ahead and disclose that that's totally okay but it's not a financial conflict Open Meetings Act, have you all had the Open Meetings Act training on the? It's something that several of the newer members do need to do. And we'll okay, so that's, that. um, I'm not gonna get into this then. Um, the one thing, let's go to the next slide. Um, you know, the point of the Open Meetings Act is obviously open, <coughs> transparent government, so the residents know what's going on. They have access to the process, they have access to all the materials. Slide. Um, the, the, the most important thing is a closed session. It's fairly unusual for a plan commission to go into closed session. It's not unusual for a village board. So, for example, the village board might be involved in litigation, it might be involved in some personnel issues, um, it may be deciding that they're going to purchase some property. Those are all legitimate reasons for the village board to go into a closed session. As a general rule, the plan commission doesn't get directly involved in those things. Um, but if at some point you think you want to have a closed session, be sure you talk to staff, be sure you talk to the village attorney, and make sure that it's okay, and then um, there's a procedure to be followed, which I've outlined up here. Um, but just, you don't, you don't want to have the Illinois Attorney General knocking on your door and saying, you know, what were you thinking? So resources, Michael and I mentioned earlier, we're going to give you a list of resources. There's a bunch of things up there. APA, planning.org is a great resource, as is the Illinois um, chapter website. Um, plannersweb.com is specifically directed to plan commission members as opposed to professional planners. Um, they've changed their model recently, so almost everything on their website is free. Um, so it's a great resource. Sometimes just go look at planningsweb.com and see all the things that they have on their website um, that would be helpful for you. And then we've got a whole list. We've got Illinois AP up there. We've got a whole list of other websites. Some of them, particularly the third bullet point, are pretty specialized. Um, the one I recommend to you, and I think you've already um, had Pete come and talk to you, is Pete Pointner planning Blogspot. He has been involved in planning in the Chicago area for decades. He is a terrific resource, and mo almost all the material on his website, he has a whole series of, I think, 40 different papers he's written on a variety of topics that are relevant to planning commission members and professional planners. So that last one on the list is also very helpful. Any other questions, discussions, comments? We can go to the last slide. Thank you. Yes. Um, this goes back to Michael's presentation. You mentioned that um, you should look at your, uh, your uh, comprehensive plan every year. Um, we did a green vision before we did the comprehensive plan, and that was like I think in 2003. So sometimes people say that, well, that document's 10 years old, over 10 years old. Is that something that stays, keeps its age, or is that something that you have to like, revisit and reprint or do anything? Um, would you call it a... A green vision. And it had goals and objectives and benchmarks for you know, a sustainable community. I, you know, the, the, yeah, the vision may change. Um, especially with green, because technology changes. Right? So there are things that we're talking about now in terms of sustainability um, that, are, that are available in terms of technology that weren't available then. Um, it's probably worth taking another look at. Um, I don't think that the, the vision or the desire necessarily gets old, but I think the opportunities to implement it could be updated. Other comments, questions, anything that either one of us said that was confusing, unclear, that you disagree with? Well, we want to thank both. Want to thank you all for coming. We appreciate your taking the time to spend with us.
two hours at the workshop this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you both for coming. We will have, um, this is part one, I guess. We have two, one more, <coughs> and two, two more. We have one more with, um, with Lori and Michael, I believe, or? That's been. Uh, to be determined. To I be guess. determined, okay, I wasn't sure. So we're gonna have one more for sure, and then the third I understand is, uh, is that definitive to uh, Patrick? Um, the number is um, known. You'll definitely have two more, but the topic um, is something that uh, we'll be talking to you about. Okay. And, um, and we can make that specific to Omar Glenn, maybe that third session. Um, both or both right, I think uh, the intent is to have both of them specific to Home Glenn. Okay. Um, and if you have any, we are kicking around a few ideas, but that's one of the reasons why I'm here tonight. Um, this is a general overview pack with a lot of information. And um, the second and third trainings might be going into more detail if you uh, request it. Or it could be on a special topic, something from the comp plan or recommendation, um, and letting you know how it's been applied somewhere else within the region. Um, or a specific zoning tool that you'd like to know more about. So if you do have anything you're particularly interested in, please let Mike know and he can communicate that to me um, and we can develop a, a program that's tailored to Homer Glenn to your satisfaction. It would be probably handy for uh, one of the neat open dates in March for our next one, so about a month out from where we are now. Is that reasonable? Um, probably. Okay, well, we'll, okay. we'll get back to everybody and I'll share that via email with our commission. Thank you again. And please fill out the evaluation forms. We don't need your name on it, but all of your comments help us. We read them all and we've been doing 55 of these and each time after someone, a couple people say something, we're like, oh yeah, we should have done it a little bit differently. So it's really important to us and we appreciate your time. It should only take you a minute to fill it out. Thank you.